So tonight I wanted to start on a positive note first and, to, and talk about the multitude of ways in which our Earth and all life upon it could be destroyed instantly. So this could happen through uh, gamma rays. Gamma rays could irradiate half the planet, uh, brown uh, our atmosphere and wreck our ozone layer. Ultraviolet light could then proceed to irradiate the second half of our planet. A collapsed star could easily do the same damage. The Earth's magnetic field could flip and leave us all exposed to lethal radiation. An asteroid could collide with the Earth and flatten thousands of miles and possibly urban cities, kicking up debris, covering us in corrosive rain. At any moment, a supervolcano could erupt and choke us with toxic chemicals. And, most faithfully, a black hole could engulf the Earth and lure us all into oblivion. So then, the Earth and all people upon it are extremely vulnerable to the existential workings of the solar system. Some scientists thus claim that in order to ensure uh, that the human race and all that it has accomplished is not wiped out in an instant, we will have to set up someplace else, that someplace else being Mars. Now, in 2010, Barack Obama, after being informed by NASA scientists that Mars did have the conditions to support life, commissioned NASA's journey to Mars. This journey, Obama boasted, would see humans on Mars by the mid-2030s, making possible that for the film lovers here, the plot of The Martian, or for the really old people, that David Bowie's life on Mars could, in our lifetime, become a reality. But... The point is this, if and indeed when we do set up our first ever thriving colony on Mars, what institutions will we put in place so as to ensure economic development and economic betterment can take place? In other words, what institutions will we install so people can earn a living and become better off? When we approach Mars like this, when we approach Mars as a blank slate, we start to see the, uh, the conditions that can produce prosperity. Because before we look to Mars, surely we should look within our own planet and see that in Africa particularly, where 383 million people live lives of thirst, hunger and destitution, these institutions, the institutions that produce prosperity, are fundamentally lacking. So then, helping uh, Africa and African people escape that poverty will come down to how well and how effectively we in the developed world are able to campaign for and install the institutions that produce prosperity. In other words, the institutions we would put in Mars. Now, there are many theories explaining the development gap and why some are so rich and others so poor. These theories range from geography to culture to history, and even to the vicious cycle of foreign aid. However, in my mind, the most recognized and fundamentally significant uh, aspect of development uh, is institutions. The institutions which we, uh, as citizens of our own respective countries, live our lives by. Um, in these institutions, I mean whether a country has a rule of law, property rights, a uh, free and fair electoral system, and uh, uh, an economy where the free market is allowed to flourish uh, and with a centralized state in the background. Principally then, I mean the institutions that support two systems, the system of democracy and the system of a mixed economy. By a mixed economy, I should clarify, I mean an economy where the free market is allowed to, as it so effectively does, allocate resources, but there is a government and a public sector there uh, to address its negative externalities and to redistribute wealth as effectively as it can. So then, many of you will be thinking, why are these two systems, why are the institutions that are the pillars of these two systems conducive to prosperity? And we'll start with democracy. Democracy uh, allows an incentive structure, it fosters an incentive structure, because when people uh, have, are protected under the rule of law, and when people have property rights, uh, and when people are given freedom of speech, they therefore have freedom. And this freedom, people throughout history have used and continue to use to participate in the activities that create wealth. These activities being innovation, investment, and chiefly entrepreneurship. And uh, a mixed economy produces prosperity, because as we've already touched upon, uh, it is where the free market allows to match demand with supply, uh, and the government is there uh, to redistribute 
uh, wealth so that everybody can play a, play a role. Uh, ideologically, everybody can play a role in the economy and everybody uh, can contribute to the economy. However, some of you still may not be convinced as to democracy and a mixed economy and why they're conducive to prosperity. So I want now to take a step back and look at it from space. In space here, we see North and South Korea, formerly united as Korea, and we see that South Korea can be seen brightly alight, uh, while in stark contrast, North Korea is almost completely dark. Now, in South Korea, we have a democratic mixed economy, uh, whereas in North Korea, we have a dictatorship under communist-led economy. It should be noted that North and South Korea uh, share the same geography, culture, and for a long time they shared the same history. Where they differ fundamentally is the institutions in which their respective citizens live their lives by. Another example is East and West Berlin, when it was separated by the Berlin Wall. As can be seen by the photo here, West Berlin uh, was a colourful and vibrant and innovative uh, place to live, uh, where people uh, lived in a democratic mixed economy, uh, whereas on the other side, in East Berlin, um, the dictatorial communist uh, state that the Soviet Union um, in enforced uh, led to a barren and rather grim landscape that we see here. Uh, another example to move to Africa could be Botswana and Zimbabwe, African nations. Now Zimbabwe uh, for many decades prior uh, had been under the rule of Robert Mugabe, a dictator, and therefore had extremely extractive institutions, thus explaining why it's one of the poorest countries uh, per GDP, GDP per capita uh, in Africa. In, on, contrastly, Botswana is one of the richest because its leaders, after establishing post-colonial independence, installed inclusive institutions, the institutions that support democracy and a mixed economy. Another example to move to our fourth continent would be uh, the border town of Nogales, situated on the Mexican-American border. Nogales, uh, on one side, on the American side, is a thriving and developed uh, place to live. Uh, because the, those citizens living on the American side inhabit a democratic mixed economy. On the other side of the border, however, on the Mexican side, citizens, quite frankly, do not live in a democratic mixed economy and therefore do not enjoy the same level of development and prosperity. Now, I'm sure at, men, at, at this point, many of you will search for exemptions. Uh, what about China, I'm sure many of you are thinking. Haven't, hasn't China grown exponentially under autocratic institutions in the last few years? Well, to this I would say the death of Chairman Mao has single-handedly allowed for this growth because the death of Chairman Mao has allowed China uh, to embrace the free market in Teng Xiaoping's free market reforms while also escape uh, the dictatorial and autocratic schemes that Mao uh, enforced upon his citizens, such as the Cultural Revolution, which sought to mobilize students against intellectuals. Uh, so, although China may not be extremely democratic or operate much uh, of a mixed economy, the death of Chairman Mao has allowed it to become a lot more democratic and operate much more of a mixed economy in a way that has allowed it to enjoy um, very rapid growth in the, first, in the past few decades. In the same vein, however, many recognized economists believe that if China's growth is to be truly sustainable, it will have to further open up its political and economic institutions. Now, consistently, for as long as we've been recording it, the world has been getting more prosperous. In fact, the number of people living in extreme poverty has fallen rapidly and continues to do so today. And if our world and if our news wasn't so dominated by Brexit or Donald Trump's latest tweets, the news very, mel very well may read that the number of people living in extreme poverty fell by 137,000 people yesterday and has done for every day for the last 25 years. And it is no coincidence that this fall in the number of people living in extreme poverty has occurred while the number of people living in a democracy, as can be seen by this graph here, has been rising. Again, it is no coincidence, as democracy is conducive to prosperity, that uh, the number of democracies have been rising while the number of people living in extreme poverty has been falling. Most blatantly, as we can be seen here, uh, democracies have risen with the fall of the Soviet Union uh, in 1989. It is also not a coincidence uh, that 
the number of people living in extreme poverty has been falling, while the value of global exports has been rising. Uh, the fact that the value of the global exports have been rising conveys how economies have opened themselves up to the benign forces of investment, globalization, and competition. However, uh, the rapid growth experienced by the world uh, for the past few decades especially uh, has largely not been an African story. In fact, although Africa accounts for a mere 16% of the world's population, it accounts for a lot more than 50% of the population who live in extreme poverty. So why? Well, quite simply, because Africa and its leaders have not been able to adopt the institutions that produce prosperity and therefore development. But why have they not been able to adopt these institutions? Well, for this, I have three possible explanations, the first of which being imperialism. Now, we know around the 1800s, when the scramble for Africa took place, that the European colonial powers invaded and sought to divide Africa up into segments. They did so that they could own segments of Africa and extract wealth from them. They thus set up extractive institutions. It has been hard for African leaders uh, since gaining their independence to shake off these institutions and install systems of democracy and a mixed economy. A second example, and second possible explanation, could be tribal feuds. Now, when the imperial and colonial powers did uh, invade, they, as many of you will know, split Africa rather linearly and rather geometrically, uh, meaning that often uh, many tribes were, were kept within the same uh, nation. And this, over, over the years, has meant uh, a lot of fierce tribal conflict and competition for power has taken place. Uh, now, conflict uh, has been called reverse development because, quite frankly, it ensures facilities are wrecked, children don't go to school, and men fight, not work. So, furthermore, uh, conflict does not allow for the process of democratization because in order for people to, uh, in order for people to use the freedoms uh, given to them in a democracy and a mixed economy, they must, there must be conditions of peace and stability that allow them to use them. A third reason could be natural resources. Now, many people think natural resources um, unequivocally and incontrovertibly um, enrich a nation. Uh, conversely, however, they have um, led to the impoverishment of many African nations uh, for three reasons. The first of which is uh, when a country has more natural resources, uh, the chances of conflict are vastly increased because opportunists within the country then seek to mount a, mount a siege against the government so they can reach the top of the government and benefit financially uh, from, the re from the revenues of the natural resources. A second reason is uh, when you have extractive institutions, as there were uh, many uh, after post-colonial independence in many African nations, um, and you have vast natural resources, then the revenue from the natural resources acts as an income uh, for the dictators and people at the top of the government to sit on. They therefore feel no need or don't even attempt to set up any sort of institutions, good or bad, and quite frankly, you can never have a democracy or a mixed economy without any institutions whatsoever. And a third reason, and a last reason, why natural resources can actually inhibit uh, African countries' ability to adopt uh, these institutions um, is because it can lead to an economic phenomena called Dutch disease. Now, Dutch disease is where um, a banana republic selling one main export inflates its currency and in the process makes all of its other exports uncompetitive. This confines wealth to one sector of the economy and therefore one segment of the population, meaning that it is often the elite and the governing class that have all the money uh, while everybody else has no money and thus no power uh, to force change and to force uh, the governing class to adopt the institutions of democracy and the mixed economy. Now, um, these challenges are faced by many African nations and they are uh, very difficult. However, they are not insurmountable. If one nation has shown how to overcome these challenges, it is Botswana. Now, Botswana um, after establishing its independence, immediately its leaders had the courage and the vision to set up the systems of a democracy and a mixed economy. Now, this meant that in the 1970s, when Botswana discovered diamonds, it did not lead to Dutch disease or to no taxation or to conflict because Bot Botswana had established a democracy uh, and a strong economy. It was able to redistribute the revenues uh, of the diamonds 
and therefore give power to all segments of society. Furthermore, when Botswana experienced tribal feuds, they did not result in conflict because they gave the, each tribe the power to express its concerns and its views for the country through democracy and through a vote and through freedom of speech. So then, Africa does face many challenges to adopting the institutions conducive to prosperity, but uh, they can be overcome as Botswana conveys. They simply require leaders uh, with the vision and stoicism uh, to employ and to implement as best as they can uh, the institutions that produce prosperity. As the French philosopher Montesquieu once said, it is leaders who first shape the institutions that later shape the leaders. So then, we in the developed world can help Africa escape poverty. We can do this through imploring our own governments to aid African leaders financially and politically into making the all-important step towards a, a mixed economy and a democracy. But why? Why should we do this? Isn't it better to let Africa get on with their own thing? Uh, haven't we got enough problems of our own? At this point, I could talk about how we fail to develop Africa, we may suffer at the hands of increased African immigration. I could talk about how if we fail to develop Africa, we might suffer at the hands of increased African crime and terrorism. I could talk about how it would be much more beneficial economically through trade for us to spend a lot of money developing Africa right now than not to. Or I could even talk about how if we don't develop Africa right now, that will be detrimental for the sustainability of our planet uh, because they will continue to add to our population at such an exponential rate. However, the simple fact, the simple truth is this. In a world where it is completely within our financial and technological capability to colonize and set up a thriving colony on Mars, nobody, absolutely nobody, in our world should be living in poverty. Morally, it is right that our immediate efforts should be to establish uh, the institutions that we would put in Mars so as to achieve prosperity in Africa. Doing this will ensure that in a world of such vast resources, wealth and knowledge, a life without poverty is a right, not a luxury. Surely, in a generation where humans will be on Mars, ending poverty is not too great a task. Thank you very much.